Namaste, everyone. Welcome to this tea ceremony. I'm Amri here in Los Angeles, and it is a pleasure to be here with you. We're going to talk some art. We're going to have some tea. We're going to have a good time. I'm going to be sending good vibes all over the world. And so I invite you to come in, chill with me, hang with me, vibe with me, spread some good news, some good cheer, because we need it now. So you may hear the rains falling behind me outside. Who knew when I woke up this morning, it was complete sunshine. It was a beautiful day. And by evening, the rains have started. And that's the nature of life. It transforms from one thing to another, from one circumstance to another. As Heraclitus says, one cannot cross the same river twice because the situation is different, the context and the conditions are different. And the same thing is true within a single day. Moment by moment, breath by breath, your life, your situations, the conditions around you and within you, they transform. So come chill with me. Come hang with me as we vibe. I have some Palo Santo wood here that we're going to light up to prepare the atmosphere for our tea ceremony. And that's what you always have to do. You have to start with the atmosphere. You have to start with the environment. And so we're going to cleanse this space, hold this space, bear witness to what is happening within our lives. Usually I use the sage, but today I got the Palo Santo wood. You can use whatever you want to use in order to cleanse your space, in order to bring your atmosphere into the right place. So I'm gonna lay that right there. And as I cleanse the vessels, that'll help prepare us for our practice, because really, that's what this is all about, right? It's about this practice of slowing down and paying attention, of bearing witness to whatever is occurring in life. And so I want to invite you to participate in the tea ceremony with me, with whatever you have. You don't have to have what I have. Just bring what you got, right? Even if all you have is a cup of water, it's about the intention that you bring to that water. Prepare your vessel, cleanse it up, get it all right and nice. All right. So um, I always start with this story because it's a good one and it's about welcoming. So there are there were two guys, older guys at a cafe. And during the uh, conversation there, one of the guys turned to the other and he said, my friend, my friend, it's good to see you again, right? And it's this idea of being welcomed into a space about being glad to see someone. And so I'm glad to welcome you into this space, into this tea ceremony and to have you be a part of it. So my friend, my friend, it's good to see you again. <laughs> All right, so let's get this tea going. Let's get the brew started so we can check out this art. I'm excited to talk about this artist that we're gonna be discussing today. So one, remember, you get your atmosphere right. We lit the Palo Santo wood. Two, you cleanse your vessels, right? You cleanse your space, that's so important. Three, you warm the pot, you prepare them, right? You prepare. A lot of times we forget this aspect of preparation. So we just pour a little bit of water into the pot to warm it up, just to get it going right. And sometimes in life, that's what we gotta do. We just gotta prepare it, right? We just gotta get ourselves going, get it warmed up. Sometimes if you have an old car, you gotta warm it up. You don't just go out and start driving it and make the engine start firing too soon. You gotta slow it down, prepare, right? So. That's where we're at. <clears throat> okay. So I got a new uh, guy wand that I'm going to be using today. This is by a Miami artist. Can you check it out? Look at that. It has this uh, kind of uh, motif on it. Um, I think it, what is it called? Not eggplant, not eggshell. Nah, it is something egg. It is something egg, Ost not ostrich egg. It's going to come to me, but it's some sort of egg type 
Um, what is that kind of egg? I can't remember the type of egg it is, but it is an egg type patina um, glaze that they have here. Really beautiful. Absolutely gorge. Okay. And so that was by a, a Miami um, artist. I got it on Etsy. Pretty cool. So we're still going with this tea, loose leaf oolong tea. You may have whatever kind of tea you want to have, right? It doesn't even have to be tea in order to have the tea ceremony, but it's about the intention that you bring to it. Okay, got the tea going there. And so just taking a moment for acknowledgements, you know, because for me, I believe in the acknowledgements, cultural acknowledgements. So this is a contemporary contextualization of a timeless tradition, the Chado tea ceremony rooted in Japanese culture. We extrapolate some of these qualities of bearing witness to the presentation, the visual aesthetic of tea, the social grace of it, the um, timeless etiquette of it. We kind of honor that in our own modern and contemporary way. But by all means, we acknowledge where we source this practice from, right? That's how we do, right? And that's all you really got to do in life is sometimes just show appreciation, right? Instead of just like co-opting and then trying to hide the uh, provenance, hide the, 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 the legacy from which it emerges. That's when people get like all out of control and get crazy about it. But if you just acknowledge something, people can see the appreciation. They can see the respect of it. And you go on about your day. You keep it pushing. But it's when you start trying to hide and pretend like you like uh, came up with this. Right. This is 100 percent. This has been done thousands of years before I ever got here. So deep appreciation. So the pot, the guy, uh, the uh, Ishing teapot, it's now uh, ready. It's all warmed up. I'm going to pour the water, the excess water into the guy Wan so the guy Wan can warm up. And into the teapot, I'm going to pour the tea leaves. Can you guys see that? Check it out. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. <laughs> nice. Okay. Mm -mm. We're going to pour a little bit of water in here just to get it going. Not a lot, just enough water because we're not going to drink this first pour. This is merely to open the leaves and to rinse them, to cleanse them a little bit. And so we give the pot a little turn just to get all the water and all the leaves. And while all the leaves are here and here, they're doing that welcoming. Like I said, my friend, my friend, it's good to see you again. And at the end of it, this is the good part. At the end of it, they were saying that uh, when they were preparing to leave, he said, my stomach is full. I've had my fill to drink. Now it is time to return home. I shall go this way and you shall go that way and we shall meet again. My friend, my friend, it's good to see you again. And so with that, it's time to uh, dispose of the water. Right, as I said, we don't drink the first one. It's merely to awaken, right? And sometimes that's what you got to do at the start of your day, right? It's not necessarily try to speed out into it, but just open gently to it, right? It smells good. It smells perfect. So the second pour is where we begin. And this is oftentimes in life where we do begin. It's not on the first attempt. There is a message here, right? There is a dharma here that it's not always in the first attempt that we get it, but sometimes it's on the subsequent tries, on the second try, or the third try, or the fourth try. It is in this process of learning to do things again, to start over again, that we learn that where our resilience lies, where our strength lies. And this is an important quality to learn in life, right? 
And so we're letting it brew. We're getting it, we're getting it going. And as we get it going, we start with the message. So. We start with a passage from Ivan uh, Turgenev, Fathers and Sons. He writes, Whereas I think I'm laying here in the haystack, the tiny space I occupy is so infinitesimal in comparison with the rest of space, which I don't occupy and which has no relation to me. And the period of time in which I'm fated to live is so insignificant beside the eternity in which I haven't existed and won't exist. And yet in this atom, this mathematical point, blood is circulating. My brain is working, desiring something. What chaos, what farce. Turgenev, Fathers and Sons. And it reminds us of an interesting quality in life, right? That sometimes when we step back and gain some perspective on our life, when we see who we are, we find that there's so much more that's taking place in life. And just as the character was saying in the passage, he was just sitting next to a haystack and realized just how small he was in view and in context of the universe and of space and time. All the time and all the spaces that he won't occupy, but here he is somehow in this moment with all of these desires, with all of these wants, there's something there, right? It reminds us often of our lives and our goals, that here we are, right, in the middle of this huge world, all these billions of people, yet we still have our own wants, needs, and desires. But when you have it in perspective, that we are also called to something bigger, we're a part of something grander. And so this is our first pour, Clarity, color, clout on point. Nicely done. So we begin with our first pour. We'll pour this excess water out. It's now warm, the guy won. First pour, first pour. Nicely done. Mm. And so, this is the first pour. We're going to blow and let it cool for a moment. As we begin to digest our art discussion for today. So we're going to be talking about the work of Abiodun Olaku. And this is The Charge. It is a painting that um, is going to be up for auction in two days at Sotheby's and uh, the opening bid is 6,000 pounds. So uh, I always wish they would have a calculator on here. Let me see how much that is in dollars, 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 dollars. So let me see, 6,000 pounds to dollars. So that's 6,988, so roughly 7,000 US dollars. 6,000 pounds is roughly 7,000 dollars. That's the opening bid, but the estimation range is uh, 8,000 to 12,000 pounds. So somewhere, maybe around 15,000, it should go about four. Um, so, Abiodun Oluku is a Nigerian artist who was born in 1958. This painting right here, this is called The Charge. And before you get into whether you like or don't like, before you 
have all those discursive thoughts taking place, just take a moment to process what you see right? Do not look away. This is the invitation of art, the deeper invitation. Remember, the artist is conveying something to you about the human experience, about humanity. Don't look away. First of all, what do you notice? What do you see in this painting? There are some men, some people riding a horse. Some are holding spears. They're in colorful garb. It's like the, the sky is very reminiscent of the ground, right? They're, they're almost kind of like mirror-like. There's almost no separation except for the sky has a little more blue, but there's still a very huey uh, earth tones in both. And Everything is kind of blending together. It's merging together. It's fading together. And this is an aspect of Oluku's work that we will see again and again. This through line again and again in some of his um, older paintings is this blurring effect. Now, this is kind of different than his contemporary style, which is um, almost a hyper realism and very clear delineations in subject matter and in form. But this right here is an example of some of his uh, um, earlier work. And so look at that. It's called The Charge and you, you get this vivid sense of motion, right? A fluidity of movement. And you'll often see this in Oluku's work. You'll often see it because this is almost a story of of, of the people, right? You often, we oftentimes say that the artist's work is a reflection of the people, of the country, of where he was born, of place, right? And through his eyes, this is, this is a movement of people, right? It, it is a charge. So they're obviously going off to a battle, to war, to some sort of, of, of military campaign. And, um, so many people, right? It's so many people and they're so vivid. And it could be that, and the question is, are they preparing for battle, right? Are they right in the midst of it because they're moving towards it? Or have they just finished in celebration and their spears are high? Or is this just someone thinking about the battle ahead? Is this more of a projection of how things were, a, a, a visualization of how things could be, a hope, an aspiration? And that's the quality of an art um, when we see it, is that we don't know necessarily all the details and we can project upon it our own experiences, right? If I was preparing to charge, would this be a reflection of Right, right before they strike, right before they go to battle? Or is it the dream the night before? Or is it after the campaign and a reflection on how things should have gone? And so there's so many messages and there's so many stories that can be brought from this. And so this is where we begin in our practice, in our study. It says, and this is our first part, right? So our first drink, our first practice, we always dedicate this first pour of tea to our dreams, whatever they are in your life. Cheers, namaste to them. Mm. That was a good first pour. That was delicious. That was nice. Okay. So second pour. Okay. <clears throat> And so, um, and so I just wanted to kind of note a couple of things. You can see the figures wearing traditional wear, right? Trad traditional garb. And so you'll see this kind of imagery evoked in a lot of, um, a lot of Nigerian work is this acknowledgement of an ancestral home, right? Of of the past, right? You, you see this weaved throughout um, many African cultures, and especially Nigerian cultures, this acknowledgement, this deference to the ancestry, to 
the lineage from which you emerge, right? There is this idea that you are not separated, that you are not, that you are a part of a continuum, right? There is a there is a movement through you. And just as his paintings are a reflection of movement, this has an acknowledgement of an ancestral home and a sense of movement. But there is also an incompleteness to it, right? You can see how the clothes, they seem to fade out, right? How the horses seem to fade out. The definition is not finite. And so the bigger question here that can really be asked is what is not being said? You know, before we ask this question of, uh, is are they preparing to go to battle or are they returning from battle or is this a projection of what is the battle that is to come or is it remembering or the fantasy of one that they hoped to be in? And so there's an, there's there's so much that could be asked that we don't fully know and the painting is also a reflection of this that sometimes in life there is so much more to the story that we don't know that the, the, the real story is the story in life that is often unsaid, what remains unspoken. Isn't that true in life? That you can go through life knowing someone but it's the story you don't know. It's what you don't hear about what remains silent, that remains the crux of the story. And so we often see that, I get that sense, that impression in Olaku's work is that there's so much more that remains unstated, that remains untold, that remains unfinished. And this is often the narrative that we see throughout um, African uh, culture, and life is this idea that they are poised, right, for a rebound, poised for greatness. The, the demographics are there, right? Nigeria has a very young population, right, an expanding population. There's relative stability, um, political stability there. There's so many qualities that are taking place that has it poised for something more. And so that is oftentimes this narrative that we see and so this painting is also a reflection of that, right? They, they, whatever it is, whether they're preparing for battle or returning from battle or fantasizing about a battle that was, they look victorious, right? They look full of authority, right? They look full of might. They are charging full force. Have you ever in your life charged full force? And there's almost, but even, even in the midst of the charge, there is one figure right here up front, who is looking back, right? Who is looking back. Let me pull it up some so you can see. There is one figure right there in the blue, the person in the bold blue. He is still looking back. And isn't that a what? That's amazing through line of African art. There is a principal, um, Sankofa, looking towards your past to create your future. And even in the midst of his whole team, his whole crew, his whole armada of individuals, a whole regiment preparing to head into battle, he's still looking back. He's still taking inventory. He's still remembering his ancestral home. He's still remembering the land. He's still seeing where the sunset meets the landscape, right? It's all the connection. And that's the power of the African experience, the Nigerian experience, the solid connection, this interwovenness of life. And so I often say there's this quality of reminiscing here. of even during the charge, looking back and thinking about what is to come, knowing maybe as if it's like one last glance, are you looking back for the final time to see your friends, to see your brothers in arms, to see their face one more time? Or is it to summon the strength to implore them to carry on, to move forward? There's so much that could be said about this painting, so much more. And so, we remember the stature and we remember the glory. Our next poem. Our 
Our next poem. It says, from Ben O'Keary, Tales of Freedom. We have not yet arrived, but every point at which we stop requires redefinition of our destination. Isn't that what the figure is doing right there? Looking back one more time, not quite arriving, but reassessing the cost, looking back and seeing what is to come. Namaste. So continuing on in our dialogue, and so this is from the Atlas Society, Ayn Rand's entity. Um, and so in this, it references some of Vermeer's work and his interplay of light and references Oluku's work and his use of light as well. And so they start with the Vermeer compa uh, comparison. It, it says, the guiding principle of, comp of his composition is the contextual nature of our perception of light and of color. The physical objects in a Vermeer canvas are chosen and placed in such a way that their combined interrelationships feature lead to a and make possible the paintings brightest patches of light sometimes blindingly bright in a manner which no one has been able to render before or since this description works equally well for Oluku. Each patch of light is slightly different in tone and hue creating a hierarchy of light vision scientist John Coendrick and Andrea Von Doren told me one night in the Scottish pub in Glasgow that the eye constantly compares and contrasts tones, bouncing from spot to spot. If tones and hues are identical, then the eye becomes bored. Conversely, if there are subtle differences, the eye feels energized. And so we take a look at Transfigured World, which kind of really echoes this sentiment that was discussed here. Here it is. This interplay right there, blindingly bright, the sun right there in the center of this transfiguration, blindingly bright, and the reflection of the sun in the water bold colors you can even see it in the fire stacks in the in the background and in the and in the shanties that are on the water of this painting of transfiguration there's almost like it almost looks like it could be a picture right there is a hyper realism about this this is abadu um Oluku's contemporary work and notice this realism and this use of blinding light right this augmented reality, if you will, that does really energize the eye, as the painting said so eloquently. It writes, um, let me see. That's it. Each patch of light is slightly different in tone and hue, creating a hierarchy of lights, right? A hierarchy of lights. You can really tell right there at the center, the sun is demanding, right? It is this blinding, incandescent ball of light, and it is radiating out in this hierarchy, right? Even around the sun, right? There's this huge bright center and around it is this glow right it's this almost aura it's this it's this expansiveness this luminous quality and that's a beautiful thing 
right? And even in the hierarchy of lights that we see uh, interspersed within the smokestack, right? You can see some are fires, right? You can see the smoke billowing around it, uh, wafting up all around it. And everything else is almost in shadows. Everything else is in, is in, in, is in the distance, right? And even in the most distant part of the landscape, you can even see the glow of the city. You ever, you ever just pay attention to the glow of the city, how it just has this ambient nature that just seems to call and pull? There's something about that. You, you driving at night through the city, you, maybe you come up to a high cliff point and you look down upon the city and you see it glowing, right? And there's this peace about it, right? There's this beauty about it. But there is this hierarchy of light and it is the light which highlights it. And this is what Ola Kuhn points to in his contemporary work. And as Ben Okiri says, we have not yet arrived. But every point at which we stop requires redefinition of our destination. Some of you in your life right now, you're at a point of reflection. Right at a place where you are bearing witness to what is occurring. And sometimes it happens because of the conditions around your life just demand it. What we're experiencing right now, this epidemic on a global level, it is a point at which many of us now have to redefine our destination. We have not quite arrived. And even in this painting, there are two ships, right? There are two, um, well, there's almost three ships, right? Three little small boats, right? And they haven't quite arrived at their destination. Isn't that beautiful? It's a wonderful, wonderful quality. Continuing on. We'll get the next pour ready. The leaves, the leaves are opening. The leaves are opening. Ah, nice. Pouring round three. Is this round three? Nice. Perfect. So we'll let that brew for a moment and we'll take in some more of Olaku's work, this 2014 story time. And you see, there's almost a transition in between, you can almost see the through line, right? From the charge, right? Where there is just this, um, uh, where there is just this uh, kind of reminiscing, where there's this faded uh, quality, where there's this um, incompleteness to like the wardrobe and where the sky meets the earth, right there. Everything seems to blend together. There's this blur, there's this deep connection. And as we transition through his work, we then begin to cut through to where he currently resides, this transfiguration where there's this hyper-realism. Um, about the works of art and where the light is blinding and where there's clear definition, where things don't seem to be as faded, but there is still this quality of pausing and reflection and looking back. And as, o and as um, Ben Okiri said, we are not, we have not quite arrived, right? We have not qu yet arrived. And that is this painting. And then we transition that is th this is probably the in between point, right? In between where he was and where he is is this space right here, is this work of art. This is story time. Round four. Round four. Right. 
So, when we continue with the work. And so this one is called Story Time. It is oil on text paper, paperboard. And so even in the quality of the canvas that's selected, it is not fine, it is rough, right? There is this quality of not being all perfect, right? It is, and this is often the nature of story, right? And what you're conveying and what you're telling, the materiality that is used is one that is not quite complete. And so you ever stood by the campfire and heard a story and just stood absolutely transfixed? That's what's taking place here in um, Oluku's work called Story Time. There are figures sitting around a fire. You can see them gathered in, in the midst of the fire right surrounding the fire surrounding the flames talking about how things were talking about the stories of old sharing the customs sharing the traditions and aren't those some of the most powerful experience that you have in life is are sitting around the dinner table talking late into the night about about how things were and about the memories of of things and about the aspirations that you have for yourself and for your family and for your people Right. This is often the quality of life that, that we really treasure. This is often a quality of life that points towards our sense of humanity. Right. That is not necessarily about what we have and what we don't have, but where we are and who we are with in this moment that we are surrounded by. This is oftentimes what we learn in these qualities when we come together as a community. And Obu. Oluku's work references that in story time. There's one figure standing up. There are all the figures sitting around. He's telling the story. He might as well be saying, there was a great people, right? There once lived, and then he slayed the giant, and then he led the charge looking back before he saw what was to come. Right. There's so many there's so many things that are conveyed in here that is this beauty of his work, this timeless quality of his work. And he and his rendering of how a story can be said and conveyed is powerful. It is deep. So we have a quote here. This by. Nigerian uh, writer Wole Soyinka. Echo next song. Echo next song. Right. This is nice. We just got to have the right music to match the message, right? So this. This a quote by um, this a quote by Wole Soy Inca. There is only one home to the life of a river mussel. There is only one home to the life of a tortoise. There is only one shell to the soul of a man. There is only one world to the spirit of a race. If that world leaves its course and smashes on boulders of the great void, whose world will give us shelter? One world, one people one story and it reminds us of this quality of stewardship that you are here to carry something to treat something with a level of tenderness and care 
How are you treating the things that have been entrusted to you? That's the question here. That's what we need to answer. And so I want to invite you to pay attention to the things in your life that have been entrusted to your care, to your stewardship. How do you bring it near? How do you establish safe harbor for it? As Wole's work said, there is only one shell for the soul of a man. As soon as you break this body, this vessel, this experience can be no longer. It can only take place in a transformed way. So you have to care for what you have. Namaste. Continuing, continuing. Continuing, go down to explore Abiodun Olaku's work. This is Migration from 2011. 2011. Once again, you see the light the blinding light, but then you see the people, you see the movement of people, and I keep saying this and emphasizing this over and over and over again, is this theme of movement, of community. There isn't separation, and all you saw of Oluku's work, when we looked at the charge, it was a community of individuals. It was a, a brotherhood, if you will. And then in Transfiguration, even the boats are grouped together, the houses are grouped together, the fires are grouped together, and there is this grouping. There is this idea that you are here to care for, to be the keeper of your brother. Right? And there, this, is, this is just part of the fabric of the culture, of the people, this community. And even in story time, we see, we see it here as well. There are individuals gathered together in community around the fire. No one is separated. No one is left out. There isn't disharmony. And in this moment, they find a way to put down all of their grievances and find safe harbor in the story. This is the power of community. This is the power of a culture. And so even in migration where there is some displacement where the demographics say Nigeria will continue to experience expansive growth um, along with a lot of countries in West Africa, just tremendous growth in population. And so there's this movement of people in search of new opportunities, in search of a new life, in search of economic prowess and a better life and the people are moving and they're carrying with them these brightly colored sacks and they're wearing almost matching uniforms right there's blue and there's white there there is this uniformity in it some of them are in lines and some of them are not necessarily in the lines, but they are moving together. They are headed to a destination together. And that's this beautiful quality of the people that they are moving in unison together, right? Walking their own path, doing their own thing, rocking what they want to rock, doing what they want to do, but still moving forward together. The line isn't linear. It's not completely straight. There are some bends. There are some curves. And that is often how life arrives at for us, right? We experience some difficulty, some tragedy, some setbacks, and we have to move. 
Right, we have to be fluid and we have to respond to the undulating nature of life. As Ben Okiri said, we have not yet arrived. And you can almost see it in the people who are in, in the migrants moving forward something, moving head towards something. And they are moving towards something deeper, fuller. And as you can see, they're moving away from the sun, right? They're moving away from these forests into like, into, into like pastoral lands. It's almost as if they're entering into a promised land, right? This idea that, oh, finally, we're out of this wilderness. Finally, we've emerged where we can see clearly, right? And that's oftentimes kind of what we can experience in life, that you move beyond this idea of, of like being caught up and entangled in the forest and in the trees and you move out into this place where you can finally see and understand clearly. And if your people are able to see and understand clearly, they're finally able to settle and build. You cannot build in the forest, right? You cannot build civilization in the forest. You have to emerge from the forest. You have to emerge from the trees and you have to find safe harbor. And so this pour, this cup is dedicated to anybody who has finally been able to emerge from the setbacks and from the trials and from the defeat and find safe harbor in the midst of the pasture in the middle of the prairie, out on the savannas of your life. Namaste. Next pour. Next pour. The leaves open, fully open. They're giving their all for this tea ceremony. Continuing on. So once again, we still see this idea of community, that people are grouped together, that it is the affirmation. Uh, it's, I like to say that um, Oluku's work is an affirmation of the soul of a people, right? It's an untarnished quality. It, it has some reminiscing around it. And there's some fading around it. And that is often a reflection of the unfinished business, of what remains unsaid, of what remains undone in life. And um, there's a beauty and tenderness to Olaku's work. We continue with this quote. As soon as it comes up. Are you vibing with me? Are you enjoying yourself? Good. I'm glad. All right. Uh, I almost took the top off there. The top needs to stay on so I can pour the tea out. Look at that grand pour. Good vibes. Good vibes. Okay. So I'm finding the next quote and we will prepare for our next pour. Okay, found it. Next pour. What should we dedicate this to? How about to... This idea of belonging, this idea of home, this idea of community, this space of connection. 
Namaste. William Faulkner writes in Sound and Fury, because no battle is ever won, he said, they are not even fought. The field only reveals to man his own folly and despair, and victory is an illusion of philosophers and fools. William Faulkner, The Sound fury. So in this work by Olaku, this is called the Arch of Ages 2. And it is an oil canvas um, completed in 2011, and it's at the Hourglass Gallery in Lagos. And so, what do we see? What do you notice here? Before you even get into whether you like or don't like, or whether you would see this in your home or not, take a moment to pay attention to the humanity, right? There is an archway dominating the composition. And there are two figures, presumably women, that are walking through the archway. And looking at the two women preparing to walk through the archway are two men, or perhaps one man and one woman. The woman is sitting, the man is looking. And the question is, Who are the two women and where are they going? Where are they leaving? What are they leaving behind? And are they leaving some trouble behind? Because you can see that they are inside now, right? Are they leaving safety? Or are they going into safety? And the question, I have that question because inside they're in this structure, right? You can see the, the roof. You can see the cave. And there's two women, potentially, one taller than the other, walking out of a cave. And there is someone with a covered face looking at them. And so the question has to be, and the, and the other woman with the orange kind of headdress who's sitting down, it doesn't appear that she's looking up at the women. Right? So is she in resignation that she doesn't get to leave too? Or is she sad that they are leaving? Is she not even paying attention to the fact that they are leaving something behind? And the question is, what are they leaving behind? Where are they going? And once again, as Ben O'Keefe said, we are not yet there. And this is also an invitation to reflect on our destination. The women are preparing to emerge through the archway. What is not being said here? What story is not being told here? Is the, is the guy that's looking at him, is he wondering why isn't he leaving? Why is he posted by the archway? Is he there to guard the archway or is he there to stop people from entering? Is he there to escort them on their way? Will they be joining him? Or will he be joining them? Or are they going alone? These are the questions that are invited in this painting. These are the stories that remain unsaid, that remain untold, that are still yet to be conveyed. And sometimes in life we have to stop when we have not yet arrived and find the space to bear witness to where we are and where we are headed. From my vantage point, from the way I look at it, anytime you leave a place, it is for opportunity. And yes, it may mean that you have to leave the safety behind, because in my opinion, the 
the person in the air, the guy standing at the edge of the archway is a guard stopping people from entering. It doesn't look like he's preventing them from exiting. So it's almost as if the two women who are leaving are leaving behind the safety of a space for new opportunity. And sometimes in life, you got to leave behind the comfort of where you are for where you could be, for the destiny that is within you, that residing within your own heart is a purpose and a calling that is bigger than your archway. And in order for you to come into it, to manifest it, to fully bring it to bear, you must leave the arch. You must pass through the arch and into the fullness of the city, the brightness of the day. And there may be some sadness, but you still must walk. And the two women also seem to walk a little stoically. You can see their shadows gently fading behind them. They are walking confidently. They, they are bringing nothing with them. They are carrying no baggage with them. They are moving into their destiny. That's how I see it. You may choose to see it in another way. They are abandoning a people, a tradition, a culture, a custom, their way of life. But there does seem to be this, this sense of optimism there. That's how I read it. That's how I sense it. You let me know how you read and sense it. Namaste. Continuing on, continuing on, Abiodun Olaku's work. I find it fitting to return back to where we started, where Turgenev said in Fathers and Sons, Whereas I think I'm lying here in a haystack, a tiny space I occupy is so infinitesimal in comparison to the rest of space. I, where these people are in this painting towards Araya is so small. They're headed towards something so much more. And whether it's in a physical space or a mental space, right, an emotional space, they are, they're moving towards something that's so much fuller, so much richer in life. This is oftentimes the story of the human experience, right? In that you're in this moment, you're in a space, you seem confined, you, seem, you think that you know it all, but then you capture a glimpse of something you capture a glimpse of something, as Turgenev said, he saw a haystack and it triggered an awareness that there's something so much more, so much larger out there. For these people that are walking towards Araya, you can see in the distance, you can see in the glow, in that, in that bright light, that there's so much more that they are heading towards, that they are moving. So my invitation to you is that you find a space within your own heart to move towards something fuller and richer, that you don't stay trapped in where you were and how you grew up in the zip code that you were raised in. That you can have expansive values, that you can have a new idea, that you can have fresh starts over and over and over again. At any moment, you can remind yourself with a single breath, I'm not quite there yet. 
wherever I am, I can find a sense of community. I can find a sense of belonging. I can find family wherever I am. And I can move towards something. I can head in a direction. Whether it's leading a charge, whether it's moving in harmony with the light, whether it's in migration towards something bigger, whether it's standing in the archways or exiting the archways of our lives, or whether we're moving towards Orion. Namaste to everyone out there who is moving towards something bigger than themselves, who have solved the haystack and recognized that there's so much more to life. Namaste. Final pour. Final round. Can you believe it? We did it. We went the gamut. We went all the rounds. We held this space like some G. So just some thoughts that I wanted to convey about Olaku's work. That the fading, the fading is a reminder of what remains unsaid, of the untold story. That there is some tension in leaving behind where one is to move towards where one is supposed and called to be. That entering into your destiny requires you to remove yourself from where you are. And that can be very uncomfortable for many people, but it is a necessary step. You caught me slipping there, right? I'm supposed to put it in here. Have to strain it. Final pour. Final, final, final round, y'all. I had a good time at this tea ceremony this time. I really admire um, Olaku's work. So we're going to take a look at Olaku's um, Twitter just so that we can gain a sense of current contemporary views of his work and the resonance that it's emerging. And so there are a lot of people referencing his current work, um, Transitional Spacious, right? a lot of his hyper-realism. I actually really love this painting. By him. Once again, there's same central themes of uh, not quite there yet, this sense of community, that everyone's grouped together, right? On all these ships, nobody is alone. Everyone belongs. Everyone is at home. Everyone is finding community wherever they are. There are those um, bright lights, right? These hierarchy of lights, as we talked about from um, Vermeer's work, and um, Olaku does it so beautifully there. So I really enjoy that. Um, this particular one, of, of all of these, of these current works, this one right here is perhaps the one that resonates most. And I could imagine it hanging in my house, on my walls. Right? That's, that's how much I love that. It, it, this offers a deeper meditation. And I really like that. This one, beautiful as well. He even paints the disarray right there, but he plates it in a, in a not a, a gratuitous way, right? You see the trash strewn about, right? You can see the, the lights emanating from the slats of the woods. You can see the fabric on the houses implying that, you know, it's not a wealthy area. 
And um, you can see the people, but they're still kind of grouped together. They're still, they're still a humanity, right? There's a reminder that even no matter what the economic condition is, there is still a dignity and a humanity to people. And you find that in coming together, right? That's where you remember the humanity. That's where you see it. Okay, let's see. Anything else? So this is Oluku painting. Nice work. There's Oluku. Nice work. Here's the uh, one I like again. Absolutely beautiful. Stunning, stunning, stunning work. Look at this one. In the rain. That's nice. Just like it's raining out here right now. Oh, look at this. Conversations. Look at that. Even the two fishermen in there coming together in conversation. This is a stunning work. This is a beautiful work. Absolutely spectacular in what is conveyed in the union, if you will, of two individuals. And even the people standing there on the dock, they are looking on. There's this grouping. Right? It is a uh, I said it before and I will say it again and again and again. We are not yet there. Throughout the work, we see Echo Nexon. All right. So throughout the work, we see again and again one, this ancestral pool, this union, if you will. The incompleteness describes what cannot be said. There is a haze of tradition that is rendered on top of a reality that is evolving and moving and changing and fluid. And there is a quality of stature and glory that is there. There's an honor and a dignity that is there that we can remember and that we can see through the old ways. We see the new. We see what is to come. Namaste. Final pour. Final pour, y'all. Final pour. Final pour, final pour, final pour, final pour, final pour. I dedicate this pour to your creative pursuits. For too long, you've abandoned, you've allowed it to decay. This tea pour right here is dedicated to you who choose to pick up the pieces, to build again, to reassess and move forward, to head towards something, to move towards something, a raya, a new house, a new job, a new career, a new creative endeavor, a new play, a new manuscript, a new work of art, a new app, whatever it is you are heading towards, whatever your Araya is, this cup is dedicated to you. Namaste. Well, everyone, we've made it to the end of our tea ceremony, and let me tell you how much fun I had. I really enjoyed it, and I hope you did too. Remember, take some time out to reflect on where you are, to look back on where you have been, so that you can see where you are going in a more clear way.
right? That layered on top of your reality is the haze and the fog of where you have been. It's, it's that constant thing that helps you reminisce and see that you create this uh, fluidity of movement. But don't forget that you are moving towards something, that you are moving in a direction. Don't forget that the story is not over. It is still incomplete. What remains unsaid in your life is something that you have to release into this world. It has to be written. Don't just allow your dreams to decay. Say what has not been said. Until next time, many deep bows of gratitude to you all for your practice here today. Lead and achieve in life. Namaste.